like a chip or something kind of be balanced over to this side. But I think everything's okay now. I don't have to ask anyone to get up and switch seats or move around. It was going to bother me, so. Man, I'll tell you what, I am so happy to be here. And I ain't just saying that. I am so happy to be here. I'm so happy to be with y'all. I love being with y'all. You know what? I love that God is right here with us. I love that he's with us all the time and that the God of the universe who through the stars in the sky lives in us and he's here with us and he loves us. Man, that's awesome, isn't it? I mean, if we just got that reality, that would change a lot, wouldn't it, Chuck? Let's thank him right now. Everett, thank you, Lord, for being here with us. Thank you that you have never left us you will never leave us. You will never forsake us. That you are a God who loves us with an immense amount of love. A love that we will spend eternity diving into. Your love is unbelievable. We are so happy that you're here with us, Lord. We are so happy that you've sent your Spirit to dwell in us. We're so happy that you've said we are your temple now. Man is my temple. And that you fill us with you. Woo! Thank you, Jesus. Thank you. Thank you. Man. I'm done, guys. That was pretty good. I'll tell you what, man. Just getting that reality again hitting me this morning, man. Oh, my gosh. Oh, my goodness. Man, He is with us. He lives in us. He abides in us. He is always with us. He loves us. He cares for us. Whoo, man. Man, just be overwhelmed right now by the love of God. I just released that in this place. A revelation of the love of God that sent His only Son. No greater love. There's no greater love than one who lays down his life for a friend. And Jesus has given us that love. Man. That's good. I wouldn't expect to say none of that, but thank you, Holy Spirit, for being so good to us. Man, I'm so thankful for a... man for a group of shepherds that love God and love his heart. I'm telling you, uh, hearing their, our conversation on Tuesday night, I had to call in because I was in Cincinnati and just hearing the hearts of John and Chuck and Jerry and David and everybody just really, it was just absolutely amazing. We have a group of shepherds here that love people. We have a group of shepherds here that love the heart of God. And they are seeking the heart of God. And they are seeking to hear the heart of God. And they love you all. I've never, by the way, do you know, like, if you haven't ever been to a shepherd's meeting, I've never been into an elder or shepherd's or whatever meeting where the people talk about you all more than anything else. I'm just being real, 100% real. It's almost always business, 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 business. And to hear them just talk about each and every one of you and how much they care for you all, I was like, I've never experienced this. This is, this is awesome. And it just shows me how much they love you and how much they care. And, um, man, I just know that um, and how unified they are. And I think that's amazing. I think it's amazing. You know, uh, the enemy from our, w- what happened last week and stuff, he wants us to divide and get all angry at each other. You understand that, right? You understand that, right? He wants us to get angry and bitter and, 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 and hate one another. It, it, he's done his job whenever we build up walls between ourselves, straight up. That's his game. I'm telling you his game. His game is to build up walls in your heart. And you go, well, I don't like that. I don't like this, and I'm angry about this, or I'm upset about that, or this or that, or whatever. Jesus come in to go, and just blow the walls apart. I'm, I'm, that's, that's not a joke. Jesus' love is coming to just destroy these walls. I remember the Lord sh- shared a little thing to me. Uh, I think it was in a conversation with my wife. I'll put those in quotes. It's probably more an argument. We, yes, I do have some arguments here and there. I'm, I'm, I'm growing and I'm being conformed. I'm transformed, excuse me, into the image of Jesus. And there was one point where, Jesus, where the Lord spoke to me, the Holy Spirit said, John, do you want to be right or do you want to be reconciled? And that goes to all of us in so many situations in our lives. And I said, well, I, 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 I don't know. Maybe rather than be right. I don't <laughs> and that's not, God has given me a heart, man. I believe that he is, a, a gift that he's given me is to be a healer. 
and I choose to be a healer. I choose to see reconciliation. I choose, I want to choose to lay my life down for my brothers, and I want to choose to lay my life down for my sisters. I'm going to choose to not get angry, and I'm going to choose to not get bitter in all kinds of situations because God loves the people of the earth. He loves all people. John talked about Revelation this morning. And I just, one of my favorite parts of Revelation is when he talks about people from every tribe and language and people and nation worshiping before God most high. And I want to tell you right now that my heart, 1,000%, is for racial reconciliation in the church. 1,000%. I want to see it, man. I don't want to see Sunday as the most segregated day of the week. I'm just being real. I want to see a beautiful picture of God's amazing paintbrush of people from every color, from every tribe and language and people and nation worshiping God and loving one another. That's my heart, guys. And man, that's, that is, I'm just uh, excited about that. I'm excited about what God is, is doing and he's doing, but it all stems from a heart of love. And that's what we've been talking about for the last two weeks. Or skipped a week. I spoke on, or Justin spoke on, and then I spoke on, and then I'm going to speak one more week here on the love of God, and you know, I told you on my heart was to begin to talk about practically what did Jesus want of his disciples, you know, um, practically how do we go into this world and share the kingdom, man, this is good news, God in us, God in you, is that good news? <laughs> There ain't no better news than that. There ain't no better news that Jesus laid down his life so that we can be reconciled to God. And so that we can just blast all these walls that we put up and man puts up and just walk in love of God and love of people. And I'm going to spend one more week on love because I'm telling you it's super foundational for us to go and to reach this world for us to do it in a heart of love. Next week we're going to talk about making disciples and some amazing things. I'm super excited about it. But I'm going to go one more week on us saying, let's connect to daddy's heart. Let's ask ourselves, are we laying down our lives for one another? Because if we have that mentality, it's going to flow naturally everywhere we go. We're not going to have to tell ourselves it's evangelism time. We're going to say, this is who I am. I am a reconciler. We have. You have the ministry of reconciliation, the scriptures say. Think about that. You have the ministry of reconciliation, reconciling people to God. That's a heck of a ministry. <laughs> I'm kind of excited about that ministry. <laughs> we get to show people who God is. He's living in us. I don't know what happened, but... Yancey's tickled over here. <laughs> it's an amen. Uh, she may be laughing at my skinny jeans. She may, I'm just kidding. <laughs> just kidding. I love Yancey. Um, I don't even know what I was saying at, that, at this point. I, got, I started thinking about skinny jeans. I heard someone say, you think I can pull off skinny jeans? What's the line go, babe? I know I can put them on, but I don't know if I can pull them off. See, this is why John's here. John can get me back on track. It was going really good. It started going downhill really fast at that point in time. Y'all turn to Luke chapter 10 to do with me. Oh, my gosh. Oh. Luke chapter 10. And we're actually we're going to talk about the love of God here, but... Through the next several weeks, we're going to look at some other parts of Luke chapter 10, which I'm very excited about. But I want you all, um, if we can, turn to Luke chapter 10. Let's look at verse 25 here. This has been on my heart for like, since we started talking about love. And this passage just has been burning on my heart. So I've been really excited, kind of waiting to, to discuss this for several weeks now. <clears throat> just then a lawyer stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? I'm going to stop right there. That's an important question, isn't it? I mean, think about this. We, we have written down someone going to Jesus and saying, what must I do to inherit eternal life? 
our ears ought to be open to this, right? I mean, the, the response is going to be incredibly important. Jesus himself is going to respond to the question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? What is Jesus' response to this lawyer? He said to him, what is written in the law? What do you read there? And so, guys, this lawyer knew he was a lawyer. He knew the law. He knew the 600 and something commands of the law. This is, this is what he was to do. This was who he was. He understood the law. He had written through the law. He had written through the Torah, read through the Torah, and he understood it. This is what his, his job was to do, to understand this. This is who this guy was, right? It's like someone today who knows the Bible inside and out, and that's their job. Know the Bible inside and out. This lawyer was to know the law inside and out. And so he comes to Jesus to test Jesus, and he says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus responds to him with a question. Don't you love when you ask a question and someone responds with a question? <laughs> hey, I wasn't supposed to think. You're supposed to tell me. I love that about Jesus because he does that an awful lot. It's interesting, um, when I think about the way Jesus taught, and actually a lot of rabbis taught and teach. See, in the United States, a teacher, we've made teachers the ones who are puffed up, who have all the information, who want to share the information because we want people to look at us and go, wow, John, man, that was a great point. Man, you must really have it. Here, Jesus cares about this guy. Think about that. What if, uh, as teachers, what if we began to look and care about the other people, that's love, we've been talking about that for weeks, more than how we look? It wouldn't be about information vomit. It would be about seeing them growing. Jesus responds, and he asks them, well, what's written in the law? You know the law, right? Pretty simple statement. I love Jesus, man. He has some great one-liners and some, I mean, he just, he just, I love reading about him. I love being in fellowship with him every day. He answered, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind. I'm going to stop right there. He quotes the Shema. It's still recited by the Jews twice a day because that's Deuteronomy chapter 6 and it says recite it when you raise up and recite it whenever you lay down. And that's to love the Lord your God. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is one. Right? And you can go and read Deuteronomy chapter 6 if you want to do that. But this is what Jews recite, this idea that God... Think about this. Every day, twice a day, they're declaring... Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's where everything starts. That's where everything starts. We want to change the world. It starts with love God with all of your heart. Have you ever, like after I read this this week, I just asked myself, do I love God with all my heart, soul, mind, and strength? Just ask that. That's a deep question, right? You know what I mean? And, and not to beat myself up and to get all angry at myself, but I just begin to say, huh, do I love God with all of my heart, soul, mind, and strength? We're going to pause. We're going to go back to that here in a little bit. But he also adds, and your neighbor as yourself. Leviticus chapter 19 talks about loving your neighbor as yourself. This lawyer may have heard Jesus say, Jesus said the two greatest commandments were love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, the whole law and the prophets hang on these things. What if we believed that? What if we believed what Jesus said? What if we believed that all the law and the prophets were hanging on loving God and loving people? Think of all the rules and regulations and stuff like that that man made that we make up in the church. You gotta do worship this way. You gotta you gotta preach this way. You've gotta have this type of a building. You've gotta do this this way or do that that way. And Jesus was telling this lawyer, all those six hundred laws, they're all summed up in love God and love people. What if that became the litmus test for Christianity, for being one with God, for walking with Jesus? If I, mean, I know I mentioned several weeks ago, often we say the litmus test for a good Christian is, is how much Bible do you know? Or how many theological degrees do you have? Those are wonderful things. 
But Jesus is saying the litmus test is do you love God and do you love people? That cuts. It does. It makes me think deeply about that. That it's not just about me receiving this information and doing nothing about it. It's about me receiving this information and transforming me and connecting me to God's heart and connecting me with love for others. This is why this is so foundational in reaching this world for the kingdom. It's going to flow naturally when we connect to Daddy God's heart and we begin to love people. Like he loves, like he loves people. And don't say you can't. You can because he's in you. If this was unattainable, he wouldn't say it. It's very attainable and it's very good. What's Jesus' response to this? And he said to him, you have given the right answer. Do this and you will, what? Live. Do this and you will live. Jerry said this morning, it's not just about holding on to something in the future. Jesus, Jesus is saying, if you love God and you love people, that's what real life is. And you will live forever. But if you want to learn how to actually live life, love others and love God. And that reminds me of Jesus saying, deny yourself, take up your cross daily and follow me. And that gets me excited about that verse. Because I recognize the love of God is putting other people's needs and caring about other people. And I'm set free in loving others and caring about others instead of worrying about myself all the time and how things affect me. I'm set free, deny yourself, take up your cross and really live He's trying to teach us an entirely new way to live. And man, we fight against that. I do. I do. I fight, man. I just think to myself, man, I wish I could just let it all go and submit and just totally trust. And I'm growing, man. He's the most patient, amazing father ever. Every, I just, he just, yes. John, way to go, man. I just, I really believe that with all my heart. I really believe that. Why do I believe that? Because Jesus was so patient with his disciples. He really was. And that's God. Jesus was the exact representation of God. Whenever we hear love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, that love Jesus with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, he is the exact representation, the exact image of God. That's who Jesus is. Loving Jesus and loving people. Awesome. That is real life. I just want to reiterate that again. Loving people and loving God is real life. The enemy wants to deceive you. Thank you, Holy Spirit. The, the enemy wants, in our society, he wants you to think it's all, they want you to think it's all about you. All about, I mean, think of the marketing, think of everything that's thrown at us. It's all about you, and he's saying it's all about them. And, it's, and if we can develop culture where we love each other, and we're thinking of each other's needs in front of our own, Yes! That's life. That's what it should be like. We should be literally thinking of how we can outdo one another with love. I think I heard a scripture about that. And so what's the lawyer's response to this? But wanting to what? Justify himself. He asked, and who is my neighbor? That hit me so hard as I was just studying that this week. How many of us justify (laughs) things that aren't, we know aren't good for us or justify getting out of things that we know would be a good thing to do? (laughs) At least Jerry does. I know I do. I'm starting to learn, I think after years and years of going around the mountain, the Lord is teaching me when I start to justify something, I probably should pause for a moment and go, is this really what's best for me or am I trying to justify it? Man, but you know I really need that sports car because i got to have a reliable transportation. So I'm about to get a $600 a month lease because, man, I, I want to make sure it's reliable. I mean, I could drive a Honda Accord, which is just as reliable. <laughs> but I, uh, I, won't, I ain't going to talk about that, or I'm not going to think about that. You know, I mean, this will get me to work faster. I mean, we can justify anything. This lawyer here, You see, Israel for such a long time had such an inward focus on themselves. Father God, 
had told them that they were to be a light to nations. And forever they are focused on themselves. They are focused on Israel. They are focused on the Jewish nation. And so this guy right here was a lawyer. And he was going to justify himself in the fact that I believe he wanted Jesus to respond that your neighbor is the Jewish people. Your brother is Israel, is the Jewish people. That's not how Jesus responds here. In fact, he tells a scandalous story. I'm telling you, this is a scandalous story. Back in the day, if they would have heard that, they would have, when they heard that, I'm sure they were like, did you hear what Jesus just said? I bet some people said, I'm done with Jesus. <laughs> I'm done with him. I mean, he's talking about Samaritans. That's crazy. So Jesus tells the story. I love how he tells parables and stories all the time. It really just hits home, doesn't it? And who doesn't love a good story? I guess God put that in us. <laughs> I love a good story. I love a good book. I love a good movie. Jesus replied, so this is his response to the question, who's my neighbor? Jesus replied, a man was going down to Jerusal- from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell into the hands of robbers who stripped him, beat him, and went away leaving him half dead. So we've all heard this in Sunday school or past times, you know, sometime before. Most of us have probably read the story of the Good Samaritan. I always like to put myself here in this situation or put it in today's day and age because we can hear, oh, man, the guy got jumped by some robbers and, you know, um, some guy, a priest came by and a Levite came by. Look, this guy got beat half dead. Like, it was a serious situation. Like, the road here, this was like a 17-mile-long road, and it was super windy, and it was just like, you ever, like, gone to a city or a place and said, that's a road I really don't want to go down? <laughs> it's dangerous. You might get jumped. Uh, i share with David, I, we had a, I went to Cincinnati this week and had a guest from another country here, and the night he came, he got jumped in Cincinnati, and they stole all his money, he got mugged. I thought, welcome to America. <laughs> You know, I mean, that stinks. I mean, awful, miserable. And that hit home with this passage, though. It made me think about this to go, what happened to this guy was no joke. <laughs> I mean, imagine, imagine seeing someone on the streets laying there. You don't even know if he's alive or dead. And it's on a dangerous road. It's on a dangerous street where you know some bad things might happen to you. Then Jesus, one of the reasons I say this story is scandalous, he brings up the religious leaders of the day. Think about this. Think about what he's saying here. Now, by chance, a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. He doesn't tell us why. We can speculate why. Some people say that, you know, According to the law, if you touched someone who was dead, you were unclean ceremonial for, ceremonially for seven days. Maybe they were worried about becoming unclean. Maybe. Maybe it was a dangerous road and they were scared what might happen to them. I mean, if you saw someone, if you're going down one of those streets that you know this is a rough place, and you see someone laying down there, would you justify not helping them? Well, man, this is rough. I don't know. Maybe they thought, this is a trap and I'm going to get jumped. Who knows? How many times, how many times, uh, the Lord was speaking that to me. How many times have I passed someone justifying why not to help? Or know a coworker that's in trouble and I'm justifying why not to help them. Well, you know this or well, you know that. A brother or sister's, you know, in trouble and there's something going on and I justify. That's what the lawyer is doing, seeking to justify himself. The Levite passes by as well. I wonder what was going through his head. Was he worried about his safety? Was he worried about, you know, um, being unclean? What was he worrying about? Whatever he was worrying about caused him not to help a brother who was literally laying there half dead on the side of the street. And again, it's so easy to read this story and go, well, I wouldn't have been like the priest or the Levite, would you? I don't know. I've seen people stranded and I haven't helped them before. I'm not telling everybody, use wisdom in what you're doing. I'm not telling, you know, uh, everyone to stop and you have to <laughs> help every single person that's in every single situation but I'm but I am saying I've done it many times I walk by the, the streets and I see someone that that needs help with something and I'm like man I got to get somewhere I got to go 
right? I got to do this. I got to do that. Jesus is showing us what God's kind of love looks like in this story. And he's blasting down these walls. He's blasting down this wall that this lawyer has built up that says, my neighbor is the Jews. My neighbor is Israel. So who does he choose to be the hero of the story? A Samaritan. Now for us, we don't, it's hard for us to grasp this because we're not back in their culture. Jews and Samaritans hated each other. They hated each other. Why in the world would Jesus tell a scandalous story where he's talking about the religious leaders who won't help? I mean, think about that too. Think of your, your favorite pastor or minister you like to listen to. What if Jesus said they walked by and just kept going? Whoa. Man, you know, T.D. Jakes came by and he walked right by. He didn't do anything. Watch T.D. Jakes. I know, that's Travis, one of his favorite guys. That was, I love T.D. That's not a shot on him. I'm just, I just know he's, I know. That's not a shot at all. See, I'm getting myself in trouble. But would say, would say something like that and say he just walked by. These are the people they looked up to, right? These are the religious leaders they walked up, looked up to. Again, what's it about? Loving God and loving people. It's, this is what it really boils down to. Will we love God and will we love people? It doesn't matter if you have a title of pastor. It doesn't matter if you have a title of elder. God is looking at our hearts. And this guy, is, he's saying right here, that this person who didn't have a title, who wasn't a religious leader, showed the heart and the love of God more than the religious leaders of the day. That's scandalous. And he brings up a Samaritan. I want you to ask yourself this question this morning. What people group do you, st- I'm going to say it nicely, what people group do you struggle to love the most? I love all people. Really? I'm just going to ask you. What people group do you struggle to love the most? Is it a particular race? Is it a particular socioeconomic status? Is it poor folks? I'm uncomfortable being around poor folks. I have a hard time. Is it rich folks? Because they have all the money. Who is it? Who is that group? I want you to think about that in your heart. Who is the group of people that I struggle? Are it millennials because they're all lazy? Is it, the, is, it, is it baby boomers because they don't understand me? You know? Who is it? Who in your heart do you struggle and go, man, is it a political, uh, is, it, is it a Democrat, is it a Republican, is it a Green Party, is it a Libertarian? Are there a group of people that you struggle to love? The good news is, is Jesus can bring healing, praise God. That's what he's doing here. He's blasting down the wall that this guy built in his heart. I want you to think about that group of people. And imagine Jesus said that group of people to you. Because that's exactly what he does here. He says that group of people, the one who they hated the most, the one they struggled to love the most, being nice. And he said, this is the hero of the story. Dude, he is crushing these guys' walls. He's telling them that the one that they despise, the, group, the person from the people group they despise the most, looked the most like God's love than your religious leaders of the day. Ah! This is so important for us reaching people for the kingdom. We've got to have these things just mowed down in our hearts so that we can go and wherever the Spirit's leading us, we can go and do and we can go and share the kingdom of God. But a Samaritan, while traveling, came near him. And when he saw him, he was moved with pity. He went to him, so he was moved with pity or compassion. He cared for them. He went to him and bandaged bandaged his wounds, having poured oil and wine on them. Then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. Think about that. This guy was showing, this is what the love of God looks like. It doesn't just look like bandaging, like it's not only bandaging their wounds. This guy not only bandages his wounds, but takes him, puts him on his camel, He takes him to an inn, so let's think about it in today's society. He puts him in his car. He takes him to the hospital. The next day, he took out two denarii, 
gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him, and when I come back, I will repay you whatever more you spend. Are you kidding me? Jesus tells a story. He says that the, the people group that you don't like, this guy showed the love of God. He stopped for him. He bandaged his wounds. He put him in his car. He took him to the hospital. He paid the copay and said, whatever else he owes, put it on me. Now, if I'm thinking about me, I ain't doing that. Because I like my money. But if I am living in the love of God, I can't help but do that. That's right. That's right. I can't help but do that. Because God's love is flowing through me. Which of these three said, do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? He said, the one who showed mercy. Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. Um, I'm going to read this quote real quick. I often, uh, I'll, I'll read Dr. King's sermons. In this one line, he he's preaches this message and he talks about the Good Samaritan. And this line just puts me in tears every time I read it. It's so spot on. He says, and so the first question the priest asked The first question the Levite asked was, if I stop to help this man, what will happen to me? But then the good Samaritan came by and reversed the question. If I do not stop to help this man, what will happen to him? Man. Think about that. They were asking themselves, how is this going to affect me? Will I be unclean? Will I, will I possibly be robbed? Uh, will it cost me money? But the good Samaritan, the Samaritan was the first one who said, no, hold up a second. The kingdom is upside down or right side up. It's opposite of our natural inclination so many times. What if I go, hold up, but what happens to him if I walk past him? What if we live, what if we live like that, man? Sorry, I'm not sorry. It just hits me, man. What if we lived? And what if the people that we walk by on the streets, we stopped thinking, what are they going to say about me? And we started thinking, what's going to happen to them if I don't share the kingdom of God with them? What's going to happen to this person, man, who's struggling if I don't help them? Because if it's my brother or my sister, I'm going to help them because they're going to be thinking about them. If it's my mom or my dad, I'm going to think, well, of course, because my thoughts are, well, what's going to happen to them if I don't help? But what if my thought every day was what's going to happen to them if I don't help, rather than how is it going to affect me? That's the difference between the religious spirit and people who are living in the love of God. What if we walked into churches and we started thinking, how can, how can God use me to help? How can God use me to bring reconciliation? How can God use me to do this instead of going, well, they don't do this right, they don't do that right, they don't do that right, they don't do that right, so I'm leaving. What if we reverse the question? That's the heart of God. What if we reverse the question in our workplace and said, how is it affecting me, how is it affecting me? We started thinking, what happens if I leave this place? Because you're the light of the world. What if I leave? Is there light shining still? Maybe God has you there. He does have you there to be light. And we stop thinking, oh, how does this affect me? And say, God, what happens if I leave? This is kingdom, man. This is real. This is real. This is foundational for us changing the world for Jesus. And I'm going to talk about one more thing here real quick. Loving God. Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. I haven't spent enough time talking about that. I truly believe that it's hard for us to love our neighbor as ourself until we really love God. The love of God flows through us into our neighbor. And I'm telling you, I think that so many of us, and, and, and I'm talking about the church in the United States, that we struggle with loving God. I, I'm just being real. We struggle with really genuinely heart. I, like we, we've got the belief thing down. We believe, but we struggle with loving God. And the fruit of it then is 
we, we st- struggle to love our neighbors. We struggle to put other, other people in front of uh, in their needs in front of our own. But when we connect to God's heart, we can't help but love other people. I don't think it's actually a coincidence that Luke tells the story of the, uh, of the lawyer talking to the good Samaritan and then immediately follows up with the story of Mary and Martha. He says, love God, and he says, love people. And if you ask yourself this morning, if you're like, man, I don't know. I, I don't know where I'm at. Let me tell you something about when it comes to loving God. Let me tell you something. He is always with you, and he's always loving you. This story, real quick, about Mary and Martha shows you it's so easy to cultivate your love for God, yet our flesh doesn't want to do it. Literally directly after the Good Samaritan, it reads, Now as they went on their way, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. I could preach a whole sermon on listening to others (laughs) and listening to God. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks. So she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her then to help me. I think a huge majority of the church in the United States where we lived are Martha's. Huge majority. Why, 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 why do you say that? I've had many messages, whether it be to large groups or to small groups, um, to college students, to um, folks that were older than me, to folks that were younger than me, whatever. And you'll notice, you know, I'm the kind of guy that likes to put into practice what we're teaching. And I've done it here even, and I may say something like, let's just be still before God for a little bit. I've seen other ministers do that. I've seen other people ask that question or ask us to do that. And unequivocally, about one minute goes by and people get so antsy. Someone will start a song. Someone will do something. Because it's so uncomfortable for us. Go two or three minutes and everyone is staring at each other like, what is going on? The train is off the track. What does this guy want us to do? Just distracted. Asking us to spend two, three, four minutes alone, quiet with the Lord, if that freaks us out, then we're probably being more like Martha than we are with Mary. Mary's just sitting at Jesus' feet. Do we want to see the love for God grow in our heart? Just sit at his feet. I'm telling you, it's not complicated. It's not complicated. It's not a bunch of works and do and do and do and sit at his feet. He desires intimacy with us. And from that intimacy flows all that we do. Think about it, man. I was on the road home from uh, Cincinnati this week. I drove up there. I was listening to some good Christian books and doing some different things, and it was, they were great, and the Holy Spirit was teaching me some amazing things. Awesome. I was about two to three hours away from home, and I felt the Lord said, I want to just talk to you. And I was like, there's like two or three hours, God. Are you asking me just to talk to you for the next two or three hours? And I felt like he said, you've been really distracted lately. Because there's other times where you would have jumped at that opportunity. I'm just bearing my heart out before you guys. I'm just being real. He said, don't be afraid to just spend time with me. I turned my radio uh, thing off. I said, all right, here I am, Lord. You want to talk for the next three hours? I'm here to talk with you for the next three hours. And it was the most wonderful time. (laughs) It straight up was. It straight up was. And I felt like Mary just sitting down listening and talking to Jesus. I left that car feeling so full, feeling so connected to the heart of God, feeling such a love for people, feeling such a love for my family. And it came from me not being distracted. Now, we can talk to God while we're doing things. Oh, yes. But here, Martha, I wonder what she was doing. She might have been doing things for Jesus, you know that, right? Very possibly she could have been cooking dinner for him. So many of us are going, 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 doing, 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 and we are wearing ourselves out. And Jesus is saying, come and abide in me. 
and from that will flow the ability to reach people for the for the kingdom and we're not going to wear out and we're not going to get tired we're not going to grow weary because we're resting in him that's why paul can go through all the stuff that he went through that we read about in the book of acts and be okay with it jesus was with him and he i believe knew how to rest in jesus and trust in jesus wherever he was i mean i can imagine martha i mean she says tell her to help me (laughs) think about going around doing all this stuff tell them to help me hey we need help with this ministry or that ministry get tell them to help me and jesus say well they're just worshiping me and they're spending time talking to me and he says he says you're worried and distracted by many things there's only need of one thing mary has chosen the better part which will not be taken away from her. That will hit home. Mary chose the better part. That's just to be with me. Now, when we know the story of Mary and Martha and them, they did other things. But the reality was she was close to the heart of God. See, we can be in the same proximity as someone and be relationally two completely different places. God is with us. You get that, right? He abides in us if, we're belie- if we believe in the Lord Jesus and we trust in him. He lives in us. But relationally, we could be very far apart from him. I could be in the same room as my wife for years, and we could be so far away from each other relationally. And I'm going to tell you something. God wants to be in deep relationship with you. These two things are the fuel for us changing the world. I truly believe it. Loving God, being connected to him, and then learning how to love people because we're loving God. So this morning, we're going to take a few minutes. (laughs) Bruce, if you just want to play something on the guitar. And have some time with the Lord. Like, honestly, if 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 you heard this and you go, man, I do struggle. I mean, dude, our phones and stuff, like, some of us can't help but pick it up every two minutes because something's going on. And the Lord's saying, there's nothing wrong with phones, but the Lord's saying, it's hard to hear my voice when you're so distracted all the time. We have so many TV shows, we have so many things, and I'm not sitting here hating on any of that. We have so many games to go to and so many places to take our kids, but the Lord's saying it's hard if you're not taking the time to listen and talk and to develop relationship. That's vital. It's vital. It's vital. If this morning you're like, man, I don't know. Like it, I, I, I do know what you're talking about, John, because I do get uncomfortable. Take some time and just tell the Lord the truth. That's what I had to do whenever I was in the car at Cincinnati this week. He can totally take it. <laughs> Be like, God, Father, God, man, uh, I'm struggling to, uh, I, I don't really know how to be alone with you and spend some time with you, but I would really like to. He's the best dad in the world. <laughs> yes, sir. This is something that happened to me this week. I, I shared it with uh, I shared it with Sister Linda Fulgham Thursday night at at uh, uh, she and Ben. I shared it with both of them at Inner City. Uh, John was talking about what we did in here last Tuesday night, and he listened on the phone Wednesday morning. I got up and I can't remember what I was doing, whether I was mowing my lawn or planting some trees. I was doing one of the two. And as I was doing that, I noticed a car come in. Lady lives next door. There's a whole bunch of people live next door to me. In the yards, there isn't a fence between the two yards, so the property line is Who knows? Every day when this lady comes in, she just parks. First of all, the the house is a party house. Chris knows where it is. They party all night, every night. And uh, this lady that lives there, she comes in and she parks in a way that she it's no doubt she's on my property. 
and it irks me. It irks me every time she does it. She does it without thinking, and it irks me. And then when I get up early in the morning, if, if Linda and I are going someplace and I look over and I see that car, I start fussing about it. It just, it makes my blood pressure go up. It makes everything happen. <laughs> Linda said, Chuck, stop worrying. It's just land. It's just land. Anyway, I'm out either planting trees or mowing my lawn. And she comes and she parks, and I see it. And immediately that spirit jumps on me. And I think, I'm going to put some nails down. I'm going to put a board with some <laughs> nails down. When she come and does it, she's going she's gonna to run over those nails, and she's going to get a flat tire. No sooner than I thought it, the Spirit stepped in. Pray for your enemies. Do good to them that despitefully use you. Bless them. Bless them. I thought about blessing. God gave us the power to do with this tongue exactly what he does with his. He gave us the power to bless those. This air that I'm breathing when I curse her is his breath. It's going out on these airs, which is also his breath that's continually feeding me. Feeding me with life. So when I curse her, knowing that that's not his will, where does that curse go? He showed me that that curse comes back on me. I'm the one suffering from the high blood pressure because of this. You feel me? Right then and there. So Lord, forgive me. But I shared, didn't I share it with you? Lord, forgive me. From now on, when it, whenever she parked there, it's not going to bother me anymore. Because he takes care of what, what he's given me. Just like he's taking care of me. Pray for me, church. Pray for me to keep this spirit that, that you now see living in me. Thank you for hearing me. tell you guys something that's a different way to live next time frustration comes into your heart because of another brother or sister or someone that we you know start praying and blessing them we're going to take a few moments now, and we're just going to be still before the Lord and let the Holy Spirit just minister to our hearts. Just be real with Him. I promise you, if you listen, you'll hear him, you'll, you will hear Him speak.